Hello everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Heather Hansen and I'm the Director of Alumni Engagement at the Leeds School of Business. We're excited to have Tulane Middanner presenting on part two of Managing Up, Creating an Effective Relationship with Your Boss for today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we begin. First, if you have any questions now or during the presentation that you'd like to ask Tulane, please send a question through the chat interface. I will monitor questions as they're submitted and Tulane will respond to them throughout and at the end of the presentation. As a reminder for optimum audio quality, we do have everyone on mute except for myself and our speaker. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please notify us through the chat interface and one of our support specialists will touch base. Lastly, a link to access the webinar recording will be sent to all registrants later today, along with a survey link and supplemental resources from today's presentation. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Tulane Medaner is the owner and founder of LifeCoach.com and the best-selling author of Coach Yourself to Success. She has gained international prominence as a professional life coach by guiding thousands of people to create their ideal life and find wealth, success, and happiness. As a leader in the cutting edge field of personal coaching, Tulane helps people restructure their lives to easily attract the opportunities they want. Tulane, teachers, uh, excuse me, Tulane teaches for Georgetown University's Institute for Transformational Leadership in Coaching, where she leads courses on authentic leadership. She holds a degree in international affairs from Georgetown School of Foreign Service, as well as a master's in English. Prior to becoming a coach, Tulane held a corporate position as second vice president at Chase Bank in Manhattan. One of the most widely recognized life coaches in the world, Tulane has been featured in numerous magazines from Newsweek to Men's Fitness and has appeared on national and international television and radio programs including the BBC and CBS Saturday Morning. Tulane has successfully coached thousands of people to reach their dreams and achieve their great ambitions from becoming a star of the stage to breaking through the corporate glass. Uh, glass ceiling. Welcome, Tulane, and thank you so much for being here again. Well, thanks for having me back. I'm delighted we have some repeat visitors here. Well, well actually, let's find out um, if we can do our little poll. <laughs> We've put some questions together because it's uh, hard for, for me to know who's here because you guys can't talk to me. <laughs> and I always like to know what's going on out there. So we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind sending those out. Heather, well, Absolutely. We'll yes. So the first question is, to Tulane's point, were you guys able to attend um, or listen to part one? I'll give you a few more seconds here. Great. We, it looks like we have a, just over 90% of you in, so we'll go ahead and close this and share. Um, so Tulane, 52% of the individuals on the call today attended last week or listened, and 48% uh, did not. And then for those of you who actually were on the call last week, we are we want and we want to know are did you have a chance to review the checklist in this webinar presentation? And as in the email, it stated it, it's okay if you didn't. So we'll be discussing those again today. I don't know if you did your homework. <laughs> right, but no pressure. Um, and don't panic all right. if you haven't done it. This yeah. time. You'll have time. <laughs> yes, exactly. So I just went ahead and closed it, and 33% um, did have a chance, and 67% did not. So uh, worth to do a quick overview and then proceed to the new information. Okay. Sounds good. All right, well, first of a hearty welcome back to all those who were here last week, and a big hearty welcome to those newcomers for today. And don't worry, this is the ex exact same slideshow, <laughs> so you're not going to get any different slides. It's just there's so many slides, I can't cover them in one hour, and listening to me for two hours in a row might be a bit hard. <laughs> so so um, I'm going to skip over why you the coach. I assume you guys have know a little bit about what life coaches do and helping people reach their goals and dreams and I've been coaching now for oh gosh 20 some years quite quite some long time that's how I got lifecoach.com it's a domain name I really it is true the early birds occasionally get the worm um, and coaching is not therapy so I want to point that out that I'm not a therapist and I'm not going to give you any sort of therapeutic stuff today okay so we talked a little bit last week so I'm just going to briefly refresh why it's so important to manage up. Sometimes we take, a, when we think, oh, he's, he or she's my manager, you know, we let the manager take the lead and the initiative and things. But managing up is really about what can you do to better 
help your manager manage you the way you want to be managed. So this this is really helpful because different bosses uh, have different styles. Uh, we all have different styles, and it's very hard to know exactly what everybody's style is unless they tell you. So as we we just saw from the questions last week, some people said, "Well, my boss is sort of a control freak." Uh, you know, what do I do with that? And then the other people said the opposite and said, my boss is really hands-off, and I never even see him. He's not even in the office. So how do I manage him? <laughs> so we've got complete extremes from one spectrum to the other of different types of bosses that we encounter, and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, but there are very different styles of management, and different employees like to be managed in different ways. So it can be quite challenging as a, as a manager to figure out, well, wait a minute, and, you know, I kind of like things very laissez-faire, very hands-off. I don't want to make people think I'm, I'm on top of them breathing down their neck. And so because you might like that as a manager, you do that to your staff, not really realizing that some of those people on your team may feel very insecure with that and they may need more clarity and more direction. So this is why it's so helpful to manage up because because we all do have different behavioral styles becoming aware of that and thinking, okay, don't just assume that your manager knows to change his or her style because you need more clarity than the next person who prefers a more hands-off manager. So that's why it's so important to speak up and say, this is what I need from you to do my best work. So you've got to really be specific and tell your boss, I need a little bit of clarity here. Can you spell this out? Uh, and then go back and say, did I get this right? Are these the 10 things you want me to, to focus on for this time? And go back and, and get that clarity. So we talked a little bit about that last week. And then we were talking about all these different areas we're going to address, <laughs> I'm going to touch on, I should say, in an hour. We won't address them fully, as you'll see, because there's way too much to do fully. But I'm going to hit on some of the key areas here about setting up your own healthy boundaries so you don't get taken advantage of by your colleagues or your boss. Teamwork, personal balance, self-management, communication, quality of work, initiative, and career path. So, and I think, did we leave off here? How well are you managing up? Um, I just don't know if we went through this too much, maybe just briefly, on stepping into your manager's shoes, managing from there, if you were going to be able to see how things look from your manager's perspective. That will make you a better a better employee. And probably the best step out of this list, I would say, is if you're not already doing this, and I, I, I'm, you, you know, I never assume, because some people, exactly some people said they have very hands-off managers, that weekly meeting with your manager, we hit on that last week, make sure you've got that, even if it's a 10-minute phone call, if your off boss is not in the office, get onto his or her schedule and get that appointment in so that you can touch base. Okay. If there's any of problems, give those to your boss immediately. And healthy boundaries. I don't think we, we talk too much about healthy boundaries, but it's really important that you set clear boundaries, especially around your time, uh, so that your boss, for example, doesn't call you on weekends or evenings, uh, that you have some boundaries around your time if you're on vacation, that you don't necessarily have a uh, phone accessibility. Right. So putting in place those boundaries is really critical, making sure you spell that out, ideally from the beginning of the relationship as soon as you start working for a place. But it's never too late. <laughs> so start thinking about what what boundaries you might need. You know, people can't call me at home or on weekends. I don't have access to my emails or don't check my texts on the weekends. You're starting putting in place some boundaries so that you can switch off and and be more relaxed when you come back on Monday. Okay, so let's let's pull up some of the. I thought I could talk about some of the. Actually, maybe on the. Did we go through last week? And I'm just terrible at this, you know. But I don't think I went through the four-step communication model for enforcing a boundary, or, or so that people know what your boundaries are. Don't think I did that. Did I do that? No, there? no, Delaine, okay. you did not do that. That'd be great. All right, I'm going to give you a really powerful tool. And it's actually not on the slide here. It probably should be. But you can just take notes and write this down. Because this four-step communication tool is really useful for managing almost any situation that you encounter. So basically, once you say a boundary is something that people can no longer do to you or around you. 
So let's just say, I'm just going to make this up, that your boss uh, calls you at home on the weekends and in the evenings. So you could put in place the boundary, people can't uh, call me you know, after 6 o'clock at night or 7 o'clock, whatever your time boundary is. That's my personal family time. Okay, so you could set place that time boundary. You could also have boundaries like people can't interrupt me when I'm speaking or people can't show up late. Or So you can have people can't take advantage of me is a good one to have for work. People can't take advantage of me. So those are anything you, you no longer want people to do to you or around you anymore is basically a boundary. And so if people are doing it, let's say people are interrupting you, you're missing the boundary people can't interrupt me. So if people show up late around you, you're missing the boundary that people need to show up on time. Okay? So, and we always say boundaries in the negative. It's what people can't do to you. you know, and you can have really obvious ones like, well, you know, people can't smoke around me, for example. So it can, you can have any sort of physical boundaries. And most people actually do have some physical boundaries. For example, most people, even if you're not aware of it, have the boundary people can't hit me. And you know, that's a very basic physical boundary. If you were in a relationship or your boss started to hit you, you would hopefully <laughs> call the police or, you know, alert your, your human resources and get the person fired. And I actually did have this happen with a senior executive in a bank, a very well-known U.S. bank. And there was a very, very senior top-level manager who was actually being hitting people. He hit, He had a guy with his cane and cracked him. And nobody wanted to report him because he was so high up. They were terrified of him, and they were afraid they would lose their jobs. So I, you know, when, when my, my client actually told me this story, I said, you actually, because her employee got hit and told her, and I said, well, now that he's told you that he's been whacked with a cane, you need to report this. And you know, it's your, as, you, as a manager, you have a responsibility then to protect your staff and employees from abuse, and she was terrified because this is top, top executive level, very top of the, the bank. And so she was terrified to do it, but she, she, she realized, you know, she did. She ended up reporting him to me, since ultimately an investigation went on, and it turns out he'd been hitting a lot of people, so, and doing terrible things like slashing tires, and really amazingly, and getting away with it just because of his position. So now, obviously, that's an extreme situation, but you'd think these things wouldn't happen, but occasionally they do. And that's a very graphic example of a lack of boundary that people can't hit me, and not speaking up about it. So... Most of the time, it's more it's the you know the things like calling you at weekends or you know doing stuff like that. So you need to make sure that you've got in place some really firm and clear boundaries. So now you say, okay, well, great. What do I do? My boss is already in the habit of calling me in the the weekends. What do I do? And so you need to have this four step model, this lovely communication model. So the first step would be to inform. So number one, it would be it's like holding up a mirror, reflecting back. So something like, do you realize you just interrupted me? Do you realize you're 10 minutes late? Do you realize that 9 o'clock, after 9 o'clock, I consider it to be my, my personal time? You know, or 7 o'clock, whatever your boundary is. So just do you realize softens it a little bit. It gives them a chance to take that backdoor exit and say, oh, no, I'm sorry, I didn't realize the time, so sorry. You know, and then say, of course, I know you would respect my time. Say what you, say the positive thing. And again, all in a neutral tone of voice, just like you would say, the sky is blue. Do you realize you're 10 minutes late? Just like that, flat as can be. No judgment, no righteousness, no sarcasm, no snippiness. Just nice and neutral and flat. And if you have to count to 10 and take a deep breath to get into that very neutral tone of voice, that is the voice of power. You can say almost anything to anybody if you use that neutral tone of voice. So if you have something difficult to say to somebody, just get into that voice of power, the neutral tone. Count to 10, 1, 2, whatever you have to do. Think the sky is blue and then say what you want to say. Okay? It's a really, really helpful technique. So that's step number one. Most of the time, that's all you'll ever have to do is just stick with step number one. Step number two, though, is to actually request. So that's taking it up a notch. If you notice, inform is just telling people what they're doing. You're not actually making a request. 
You're not asking them to do anything. You're just saying this is what you are doing. So that's very gentle. Good for using with colleagues, family, friends, children, bosses. This works for everybody. This is just the most brilliant thing. Second, you would say, I ask that if you're meeting me, you show up on time. I request. Request is a little bit stronger. To say, I request, those are the powerful words. I, you might say, I request a weekly meeting. You're never in the office. I, I need more contact with you. So again, I request in order to put everything in a very positive way. Think about it very positively. Say, I request a, a weekly meeting on Tuesdays at 9 for 15 minutes. Or, you know, and this will help me get my work done and keep interrupting you, know, keep having to interrupt you during the week. So that's number two is request. The third step is to demand or insist. And that is, I, I require that if you're meeting me that you show up on time. And at this place, you put in place your consequences. And if you don't, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start the meeting without you. We will lock the doors. Yeah, whatever you, you know, whatever your punishment will be, in a sense. With children, they will take you to step three every single time. I have two kids, and I can guarantee you they will test to see if you're serious. With adults, you can usually get away with one or two in form or request, but occasionally you'll have to take it to demand or insist and get tough and put some consequences in place. So you might want to think ahead of time what those consequences will be. So you know, if, you, if you make a request and say, yeah, I, I, I would request that you don't call me on weekends. So first inform, and if that doesn't work and they still keep doing it, then you move to request. I ask that you not call me on a weekend. And then you could say, you know, demand or insist, you know, I, this is a condition for me to, I need my time to relax. So hopefully you rarely, rarely, rarely have to go that far, but you do need to be prepared. And then ultimately the fourth step is to leave and to leave can be a temporary thing where I'm going to hang up the phone now and I'll carry on this discussion when we can both speak without shouting at each other. You know, so that might be if you're in an argument or a discussion. You might leave the room temporarily. So, like, I'm going to leave the room and we'll, when we can calm down, we'll carry on. So it could be temporary, but sometimes we end up leaving permanently. So, for example, if your manager never respects your boundaries, you want to ask yourself why you're in this job and look for work elsewhere. So you may choose to leave. And I've had clients who've done that, who've left jobs where uh, abusive managers could not be trained through this four-step. And I actually had one client use the four-step model on her uh, sort of sexist uh, manager who was always making rude, lewd comments to the women in the office. And she used this model, and he stopped picking on her. But he was still picking on all the other women in the office. And so she said, enough of that, and quit and ended up getting a much better job with a really great boss in the next position. So really good. So really powerful to inform, request, demand, and leave. And at demand, that's where your consequences come in. So it is, I go over that in uh, my book, Coach Yourself to Success, that has 101 tips in it. That's one of the tips in the book. So if you want more, that is actually available in there with a few more examples. But very powerful tool. Again, works on everybody, bosses, colleagues, kids, friends. Okay. Any questions about these uh, this healthy boundaries checklist here? And the idea, the idea here is to use this as a checklist for yourself. I'd recommend printing this PowerPoint slides off and just literally checking them off if that's true for you and saying, yep, I do that. And if it's not true for you, maybe underline it and focus on what are the things that you want to change about your own boundaries. Just pick one or two things at a time. Don't try to do everything at once. If you just put in place boundaries, that's, that's life-changing if you haven't done that before. It's about respect. And here's the thing. With the boundaries, you're going to get respect. Without boundaries, you will be a doormat. And people, even very nice people, can't help, they can't resist, but walk on a doormat. So that's the key thing to, to think about there. Don't want to be a doormat. Anybody have a question about that, or if that makes sense? All right, I'm just going to carry on through the next checklist here, the teamwork checklist. So again, now I won't be able to go through all of the points on this uh, <laughs> because you know, we don't have time, but 
I can pick out a couple of, of things here. So if anybody has a particular question on this, you know, jump right in, in in the chat and let me know if you don't understand. I think you know, most of them, they're pretty self-explanatory. I know how to be a great team player, and I am one. You know, if one way to check is to ask your manager and say, do you have, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do I rate as a team player? And see, with 10 being high, how you rank. So what I thought I would talk about today is the team is set up to maximize strengths, not weaknesses. And last week we talked about the range of human behavior on on the uh, there's like a multicolored chart. Actually, that is that didn't have that on here. Uh, that range of human behavior shows you that certain people have certain strengths in their their behavioral style. It, you know, some people are are chatty and build relationships and warm and friendly. Those would be the people on the team that you'd want to be doing the sales calls. Some of the people might be more detailing oriented or like to do the research. Obviously, you want to use people's strengths. So really take a look and see, are people in your own team using their strengths? Because so many times, and I think this is starting to change at long last in corporate America, so many times when we get evaluations from our boss, the evaluations focus on our weaknesses and then ask us to improve our weaknesses, which is actually a really bad idea because you're much better off and it's much easier to be successful and it's much more fun if you could actually focus and develop your strengths. Now, to a certain extent, we do need to know what our weaknesses are mainly so that we can get somebody else on the team to do that stuff because you'll probably never be brilliant at it. Now, I realize you may have to do some damage control. And even uh, Tiger Woods, a great golfer, and he was, has, his strength in golfing was the long shot. His weakness was getting into a sand pit. And he had a, a statistically, he was not as good as get, at getting out of a sand pit as other golfers. So that was his weakness. So of course, with his strength, he focused. His coach would have him focus on his strength, never getting into the sand pit in the first place. But occasionally, they had to work on practicing getting out of a sand pit because if he ever to get in there, he would have to get out. But they didn't make that the main focus. So yes, you may need to do some damage control if your weaknesses could derail your career. But you don't really want to. You don't want to maximize your weaknesses. You want to maximize your strengths and build on that as an individual on the team. And so ways you can manage up in that sense are thanks, you know, your boss says, hey, can you do this? And say, gosh, you know, I'd be happy to do that. My strength is da 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 da. And you know who's really good at this sort of thing is Joe Blow. I mean, you know, so you could say something like that and say, highlight to your boss who's actually better at that potential job that he's offering. Okay. Heather, were there any questions come in? No, no questions yet, so feel free if anyone okay. has any questions or needs any um, examples to talk through, please send them on your right-hand side under the chat feature. So what I'm going to do is, because obviously I can't go through each one of these points, with, we'd be here for quite some time, I'm just going to take one or two from each checklist and then we can, if there's one that catches you and you want, I will go back to it because we will break for questions. And uh, at the end, we'll have some time for questions as well. So if there is something that doesn't make sense to you, just let me know. Okay. So the personal balance checklist here, again, going through each one of these, do I have a rewarding life outside of work? And that keeps things in perspective. That keeps you healthy. Uh, here's one. <laughs> uh, it may sound, uh, I know where I am on the path of development. That's down on the bottom here. If you look at that one, I know where I am on the path of development. In coaching terminology, when we're talking about that, that may not be your career path, which could be one way of reading that question. The way a coach would read that question is, have you gone through Maslow's hierarchy of needs? So in coaching, what we want to do is develop people from getting past survival needs. So if you think of Maslow's hierarchy as a pyramid, survival needs, do you have food, clothing, shelter? would obviously be critical and at the base of the pyramid. If you don't have those, you're not going to really be focused about anything else. Second from that would be your 
emotional needs, personal and emotional needs. So once you've got your survival needs met, then you think, okay, where am I going to get my love in? <laughs> so how can I get love, appreciation, uh, cherishing, uh, maybe your need could be personal, could be to be in control or a need for peace or a need for balance. But these personal and emotional needs are requirements for us to be our best. And I find a lot of the conflicts and a lot of kind of emotional distress that people experience at work is that subconsciously or unconsciously we're trying to get our emotional needs met from our bosses. <laughs> we, you know, and this is what psychologists will tell you is that people think you know that they can try to they want almost maybe perhaps a parental figure in there again subconsciously. So it's really important for you, and this will help you be a incredibly much more professional employee by getting your own personal and emotional needs. So that would be the bottom one here. I am emotionally well, and my top four needs are fully satisfied. If you can identify what your top four needs are, because there's hundreds of different needs. I just mentioned a few of them. But if you could pick out what your key needs are, and once those four needs are satisfied, you will find that you're less needy. And what we know about anybody who's needy is that neediness is repellent in some way. It pushes people away from us, not draws them, not draws them to us or attracts uh, them to us. So by getting your needs met, you will find you attract people. And I, I don't mean in a sort of necessarily sexual way, although I suppose that could happen. You can attract mates that way, but you will be a more attractive professional person to everybody, male and female. People will, we want to be around people who feel confident, who don't need anything from us emotionally. They don't have any repellent quality. The truth is all people have emotional needs. It's part of being human. But when I, say, if I tap you on the shoulder and said, hey, you, what are your top four emotional needs? Could you rattle them off? I know I couldn't I know, until I did the quiz. So we designed this emotional index quiz at lifecoach.com. Don't take it now, but we'll put that um, link through to you at the end so that you can go and take it. The reason I don't take it now, it takes 20 minutes to go through it because we're sorting out over 100 different personal and emotional needs for you. It's free. It's absolutely free. It's a resource on lifecoach.com that I just want everybody to do this because once we get our needs met, we then move up to the top of the hierarchy of Maslow's hierarchy, and that is getting living in accordance with our values, your core values. And when I say I know my top four values and set goals around these, values such as you might value beauty or uh, you might value creativity or learning or family or peace. So, you know, figuring out what your core values are, the things that are absolutely the most important to you, and then orienting your life around that. That's at the top level. So we go from survival needs at the bottom, which is the clean sweep program. Uh, if you, I've given you guys that as a bonus. I'm not really going to even discuss that. That's so basic. It is questions like do you floss your teeth or not you know that basic are you actually taking care of your basic survival needs and and, and you know modern life is complicated so there's over a hundred points on that clean sweep program but I would consider that to be the bottom of the pyramid that's modern day survival checklist so 100 points to get that ticked off second then would be to take the emotional index quiz find out what your four needs are your top four needs are the quiz will send them to you automatically by email Okay, so you'll know what those are. Because how can you get your needs met unless you know what they are? That's a good starting point. And then from there, you'd work on what your values are. And ideally, you want to be working for and making sure that you're in a company that is in alignment with your own values. So you want to make sure that that's something you've done. And if not, you may need to look at changing professions if, if they don't match up. But that's where we, we, can, we can do our best work when we're in alignment with our own core values. Okay, so that's just a, a little tip there on personal growth, really, is what we're talking about. That's what human growth and development is, getting past survival, getting your personal emotional needs fully satisfied so that you are completely satisfied with that, and then euphoria, happiness, joy, all that good stuff comes at the top of the pyramid, and that's the top four values. And that's pretty much what we work on with our clients, is getting them through to those four levels. So pretty, pretty, pretty neat stuff to do. Self-management checklist. Is there anything that's 
good one. I've mastered time management. The important stuff gets done well. <laughs> this used to read, it all gets done. <laughs> Everything gets done well. But no, the executives, modern day executives, people in any job nowadays, you can't get it all done. There's too much information. There's too many emails. It is, it is literally impossible nowadays to get everything done. So what executives do now is they cherry pick. They pick the most important things. And they would take a look and see. Uh, I, I, I use one very simple tool. Stephen Covey talks about a, a time management technique. It's a four quadrant theory of time management where you, you, there's the important things that are urgent, so that has to get done right away. There's unimportant things that are urgent, and that would be a, a wrong phone call. So it's urgent and interrupts you, but it's unimportant and completely useless. And then there's the important stuff that's not urgent, so there's really important stuff, but there's no urgency as, associated with it. And then there's just stuff that's not important, full stop. So you've got the the whole range there. And you know, you're trying to look at your day and put it into, well, is this which four quadrant does this go into? That's kind of a tricky thing to do. And so what I what I recommend that people do, and you can try this as an exercise, is just do three questions a day. And just ask yourself, and this will help you prioritize and figure out what is the really important stuff. So number one, what's important about today? And it might be that what's important about today is that it's your son's third birthday and you want to get home early so that you can make a cake and get the party set up. You know, maybe that's the most important thing about today and you need to organize your life around that. So may you think about your work and your personal life and see how you can, can you know, really focus on what's most important. The second question is what must get done today? And that's absolutely must, not what I wish or hope to or would like to, but what absolutely must get done today. And then third, what is important about the future? So if we're only focused on today, we can lose sight of the fact that, gosh, next month there's a big presentation or a report due and I need to talk to Susan and finance uh, department to get this report from her before then. And so you, you don't, you lose sight. If you're only focused on today, you're going to miss stuff that's going to be too late to prepare for. And it's even in the larger future. And what's important is it that I'm saving for my retirement account or, you know, think, think about it, that I want to write a book or something. It could be much bigger stuff, okay? So those three questions will automatically get you focusing on the important stuff and you, you'll be able to, basically you'll be using Stephen Covey's four quadrant time management theory, just like that. By, by you know, I think it's easier to think of these three questions than it is to try to think, Hmm, is that urgent or is that, yeah, it gets complicated. Any questions so far? No, Talene, you, you briefly, well, there's one, you briefly mentioned um, some tactics around this, but in case you can elaborate more, one individual had written in saying um, they ha were having issues of being too needy or being perceived as being too needy with their supervisor. And do you have any, you know, best practices or tactics that this individual can do so they don't come across as needy. Yeah, absolutely. If you're concerned at all about that, then I highly recommend that you get to that emotional index quiz. Let's take that. Again, do it. It takes 20 minutes. You'll get your top four needs. Knowing what your needs are, you can then set up a, a system. You basically need to fulfill them and satisfy them and think about that, how you're going to do that. So, and again, we've got tools for you if you need that. But if you do feel that that is, if you think that you're needy, because a lot of people don't realize that they're needy. Most people don't. You know, we, do, we don't notice our own neediness. <laughs> but once you get your needs met, you're really going to notice other people's as well. Um, and, and the good thing is that you, if you could figure out what your boss's needs are, does your boss have the need to be in control? Does your boss have the need to be right? Two very common needs. If you want to satisfy those needs, then they disappear. And they have it's kind of like food. You know, you eat a big meal, you're really, really hungry, so you have the need to eat. You have a nice meal, and you're full. And if somebody says after Thanksgiving dinner, do you want to have a banana? You're like, are you kidding? I've just had this huge dinner. I can possibly eat a banana. So you do actually reach a satiation point. You will get satisfied. And your needs work the same way as well. You are not a bottomless pit. So you can actually satisfy needs. Now, the people who are bottomless pits 
are the ones who don't have those boundaries in place. The boundaries protect you so that your needs can get met. So it is a, you could be a mighty oak tree and really strong, but if every day somebody takes an ax and takes a little whack at you, you will come down eventually. So we cannot allow our people to take little cracks at us. It's not acceptable. All right. Good question there. And totally curable. I mean, this thing about neediness, it is completely curable. The combination of knowing what your needs are, getting them satisfied. There will be some work there. I'm not going to kid you about that. You do. It will require a bit of introspection. And it is actually the most challenging thing that most people bump up and against when they're in a coaching program. Uh, and a lot of coaches don't even like to talk about it because it's so hard. <laughs> but once you get through that, the rest is just clear sailing. So that is that is quite a challenging thing to do. But the boundaries make it all possible as well. So you can see, for example, if you have the need to be appreciated and then your boss or colleagues criticize you, that need's not going to be satisfied. So you need to have the boundary in place. People can't criticize me. So I go into great depth uh, in this. And oddly enough, the book is called The Secret Laws of Attraction. Because if you want to attract people, you need to have them respect you. And that comes from boundaries and getting your needs met. So this book on attraction, it's about a relationship book, actually works for, uh, it works exactly for that, for getting your own needs met. It gives you specific instructions on how to do that. So that you might want to jump to that book for, for more work on that. Good. Any other questions? That's it for now, Celine. Okay, great. Well, we'll carry on. So don't worry about getting it all done. Get the important stuff done. All right, I'm going to just sail on to the next slide on communication. Once again, I'm just cherry picking a few myself because we won't have time to do all of them. I think the one that would be the we talked about the charge neutral tone of voice. That's the sky is blue voice. So that's very important. Uh, I make my, this one probably you don't, it doesn't make sense without explanation, so I'm going to talk about this one. I make my points quickly and powerfully. I use messages. All right, so what's a message? I could do a whole one hour talk just on using messages, so I'm going to give you the quick and dirty answer. A message is something that advertisers use to convey their points in a very, very short period of time. And advertising has, has been, you know, they need to do this because they have very little time, say, you know, a couple seconds for a commercial. Uh, they have very little time, and they need to get an impression on your brain, in, a, in effect. They don't want to stick into your brain. So a message is a sticky, catchy statement of truth, which is when we were speaking about that, uh, presented as a new truth or something new and fresh. It's not a cliché. It's the opposite of a cliché, which is old. It goes in one ear, out the other. You don't hear it. It doesn't have a stickiness to it. A message comes across as being fresh, and and uh, could have a bit of zing to it. It's short and to the point. And so um, the best example I can think of that is Nike's Just Do It. Three words. It's very active. Just Do It is pro proactive. It's inspiring. It's motivating. And it gives you kind of the, the, the desire to move. Just do it. Just do it. Go for it. So that, that short and to the point use of that way of speaking and if you'll notice it never a message will never have the word I in it so you'll never say something like I think you know, you're terrific you would just say you are terrific delete I think you are terrific that's presented as a universal truth much more powerful so if you're in a meeting and you want to make a point instead of saying I think we could improve sales by 10%. You just make your statement. And that, the quick way of using messages is delete, I think. So that, that's what I would say for uh, getting your messages across. But try to think of how you can say things in a short, zippy, catchy way. And just wing them out there. People will hear you. So if you're in a meeting and you want to make a point, get it as short, punchy, catchy, tight as you can. And take the word I, well, in my opinion, or I think, delete that. Just drop it in there. Okay, that's really powerful. It takes practice. You can start practicing with compliments. So instead of saying, oh, I really like your tie, just say, great tie. 
I think we talked a little bit about that last week, so I won't go into that too much more. Quality work. So again, uh, let me explain what this is. My personal standards are very, very high. We talked about boundaries, and boundaries is the conduct that other people engage in. So that's other people's conduct. Your personal standards, that's the conduct that you hold yourself to. So while a boundary might be nobody can interrupt me, the standard that goes with that is I never interrupt others. So if you have a boundary, people can't waste my time, then a standard that would go for you would be I always show up early. So the standards are the flip sides. And you want to look at people you admire in the world, in the workplace, and hold your standard to them and have that be your bias. Your standards, if you're going to raise your standards, they should be higher than that, what they currently are. So for example, if you show up at time for meetings, raise your standards so that you're five or ten minutes early and see what that provides for you. Just little touches like that give us a grace may help us be more relaxed, we're less harried, we're not running around like a chicken without a head. And it's so important with standards, and you know, look at the current situation with American politics at the moment. The standards have dropped. <laughs> they are very, very low. Pick somebody to, you know, to raise the bar. Let's, let's all raise our own personal standards up. Let's not go down to the gutter. Okay. Any questions about that one? Selene, we actually had a question on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk to someone who gossips a lot, how do you keep your conversation focused and not get sidelined? Oh, good, yeah. So I don't gossip. Yeah, that's a tricky one because some offices can be very, very chatty, gossipy places. There's a very graceful way to do that. And your standard for that could be, I only talk about people if they're present. So I don't talk about people who are not present in front of me. So they would hear. One step below that standard would be, so it's a very high standard. Sometimes we talk about other people. Make sure that if you talk about the other person, you'd be completely comfortable with them standing right next to you as you're saying something. So if they're completely comfortable with that, then you could talk about somebody else. <laughs> so if you aren't comfortable with saying something to that person, then don't say it. <laughs> My mom always had a saying, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. That was drilled into me as a child. <laughs> and it's actually a really good rule to live by, <laughs> my mom's rule. <laughs> but I don't gossip. So if people are gossiping around you, let's say somebody says, oh, I've got to tell you this thing, da, 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 this juicy thing, da, da. and you can say, yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. You, you want to share that confidence with me. However, I'd feel um, I prefer not talking about anybody who's not present. Or you could say very graciously, I prefer to hear, you know, I know you want to talk about Susie, but I'd really prefer to hear about you and what's going on with you. So just shift that conversation and focus back on them. Okay, so that you don't, you know, it's just shift it back to them. Yeah, and that it can be tricky if you're in a very gossipy place. But the key thing for you, especially uh, in terms of getting respect, we don't actually trust a gossip, do we? If you're going to get up in this management world and be successful, you need to have people trust you. And ultimately, we may enjoy a bit of juicy gossip, but we don't trust people who are gossips. So for you, in terms of becoming a leader and raising your own standards, raise that bar to, I never gossip, or I only say things that are unconditionally constructive. Okay, So really positive about everybody. Good question, though. But yeah, gently redirecting it, or you could say, "I'm sure you're you're not aware," but or I don't feel comfortable talking about John when he's not here. Something as simple as that. Again, that's informed. It's not even a request. You're just saying, "I don't feel comfortable." So you're back to boundaries again. Inform, and that's a, a I uh, people don't gossip around me. That's a boundary. Good question. Any others? Nice that we can kind of work them in as we're going through. Quality work. Uh, so we talked about standards, and so that, you know, I think that's the key point here. Let's see what else we got. Take initiative. Let's talk a little bit about that one. I had people usually ask me this one about what's this insurance, <laughs> the one in the middle here. 
I take out insurance when I take a risk. I'm not foolish. You know, to take initiative and solve problems, at the same time, you want to, you might want to just check in with your boss or have some sort of, of, of deal where, you know, if I'm not 100% sure, is it okay if I call you and just pick up the phone and say, or if there is a problem and things aren't going right, and it's getting out of hand, I'm just going to let you know immediately. So a lot of times, and I think sometimes men get hooked with this one a little bit more than women because men in our culture are raised to be right and women are raised to be nice. And so women are afraid to to not be nice because then they get called bitches at work and and we expect them to be nice because there's our whole cultural expectation is that they're these gentle, nurturing creatures. So if they fly in the face of that, then we don't like it. This is just a cultural conversation that's there. And again, for men, that's why men don't like to ask for directions. <laughs> They're supposed to know. We expect our men to be strong and know things and not have to ask questions. And so they don't want to appear ignorant. And so that's when you can get into trouble when things are going wrong is not getting, taking initiative in a sense to say, you know, things are getting out of hand here. You know, get your boss in as quickly as possible and let them know that there's a problem. I wrote for this one down, take at least one big risk a week, wearing pants to the bank, training staff to lead meetings, asking for a raise. Um, when I was working in banking, this tells you how long I've been in banking, it was not acceptable for women to wear trousers to work. You were supposed to wear skirts, pumps, and uh, stockings. So I, when I was prepared to get fired, I started wearing pants to work trousers, and nobody fired me. <laughs> so but that was a big risk at the time. But I'm sure you know that you know that may not sound like a risk now, but at the time it certainly was. You know, and it, it, it's an appropriate risk. I wasn't wearing cut-off jeans or something like that, which would be an inappropriate risk. So my insurance when I did that was that I was prepared to be fired, and because of that time, I wanted to quit and start my own coaching business, which is what I did. Okay, so not being foolish. If you want to break the dress code, do it gently. <laughs> Don't come in with cut-off jeans or something inappropriate. All right, so in terms of insurance, you might want to have somebody back you off and say, uh, you know, if I'm going to do this, can you back me on this and get your boss to support you on that? The career path, there's so many of these. Uh, let's see, I think I'll st I have a clear plan for my career path. So many people expect their manager to design their future for them and their career path and that either a good manager will do that. A good manager will think, gosh, you know, this person's been in this job a long time. I wonder if they're getting bored. What new challenges can we give them to keep them interested and motivated? Yes, that is what a good boss would do. But most bosses are really busy and can't be thinking about your career path and are you completely happy doing what you're doing and are you getting bored? So you need to take the, the initiative in that sense to say, okay, this is what I need for my personal growth and development. This is what I need for my career development. And take a look and see, perhaps there's some strengths there that you could get additional training on and you could say, make a, a pitch to your manager and say, hey, look, there's a leadership course that's coming out or a communications course or a sales course or whatever computer course. I'd like to brush up my Excel skills. Can I take this course today and, and uh, will the company pay for that? Because oftentimes they will. But it's very proactive and it's really great when you are taking charge of things. And then letting your manager know, oh, I'd like to volunteer to work in the sales department you know, for a while so I can learn that side of the business. Or taking it, you know, and seeing if can I support them. I'm going to do this volunteer thing or this community service thing or getting out there and creating a, a name for yourself, getting known in, in your particular industry as an expert. Maybe you write articles and and get those published and you, you, you speak perhaps or uh, are members of associations in your industry. So getting out there and making your own independent name and not just relying on your manager to create a career path for you. It's basically being responsible for your own success. And Shalane, we have a question on this slide. Mm -hmm. um, how do you develop fearlessness? Yeah, that's actually a good one. Um, fearlessness. I don't, you know, the whole <laughs> courage, the definition of courage is that you're afraid and do it anyway. Because if you were absolutely fearless, 
then you wouldn't need courage, would you? So you don't need to get be fearless in a sense, but you do need to be courageous. And for most people, that's, the fearless people can often do foolish things because they don't fear heights, they jump off a cliff you know, or something crazy. But you don't necessarily want to do that. It's, it's all right to be very, very, very scared and do it anyway. Think it through. Don't jump into things. Think it through ahead of time. Uh, a lot of the work that we do with coaching is strategizing with people. All right, how are you going to ask for this this rate? Okay, well, have you prepared your your ten reasons why you deserve it? You know, okay, well, can you do you know how much you want to ask for? You know, what salary rate you should have? You done your research? You know, we actually do a lot of preparation before you go in and just ask for a rate, so people are confident when they go in that they are, they are worthy of it, they've documented it, they've been having these weekly meetings with their boss so their boss is aware of what they're doing, they've been showing their initiative and saying, you know, doing stuff in the community or doing things within the, uh, the company, the wider company. And, and as a result, you know, it shouldn't be a big shock and you should actually naturally get that raise. But uh, a lot of women don't know that you actually may need to ask for a raise. Sometimes people think that if they just do a good job, the boss will come to them and give them a raise. And some bosses will. But a lot of times the person who asks is the one who gets the raise or the bigger raise. So demonstrate, because it's hard for bosses to keep track of everybody. And so you need to be demonstrating your worth and showing what you've done consistently and, and, and taking on challenges. Say, hey, what do I need to do to get to the next level here? What would really make your job easier that I could take over for you? You know, create, do stuff that makes your boss know that you're a great employee. So you can see a lot of this stuff is about managing up. It's also, are you actually being the best employee you can be? I'm sure there's a couple of points in here you've probably said, hmm, not sure I'm doing that. So the, the fearlessness also comes in a sense, or I should say courage. Having the tools makes a difference. I found that four-step communication model, that's just one communication tool, but it's a really good one. That tool, knowing you've got that in your back pocket, knowing what you're going to say ahead of time if somebody crosses one of your boundaries, practicing it even in front of a mirror at home. In fact, to anybody who's going to ask for a raise, get in front of a mirror and ask for that in front of a mirror. See if you're squirming or your facial tick pops out of you know, or you're, you're looking not very confident or you don't say it loud enough. You've got to get that down pat and smooth and feel really confident with that. Great, thank you. And we have one other question right now. Uh, what is your guidance if your boss is also a personal friend, um, they were good friends before working together, especially relative to the way to make the business better? Well, working with friends can be wonderful and also be really tricky. And I think, you know, you always want to put, I would say, you've got to put the friendship first. If you think about things, what's most important to you, that friendship is, is absolutely essential. But taking a look and saying, okay, this, you know, talking about the key thing with this is going to be communication, being really open and honest with each other and saying, gosh, this is really weird with you being my boss, or no, I love that you're my boss. Or, different people have different reactions to it. But talking about it and saying, you know, how can we still keep our friendship and get the work done? How can we make this really a great and fun thing for us to do? There could be a million different iterations of this. So without individual specific things, I'm probably just shooting into the wind here. But you, you, if you keep the communication open and anything starts to go wrong, even the smallest things, nip them in the bud. And again, use that in form. Gosh, when you said that, that didn't quite, you know, it didn't quite land right for me. If you think about what communication is and really communicating, you need to be responsible for what the other person has heard. So if you're communicating, you've got to be responsible for what they hear. You might not have meant it like that, but the fact that it landed with them is your responsibility in a sense that your communication responsibility. So you can say, oh gosh, so sorry, I must, I must not have said that quite right or that's not how I meant for it to be. 
But nobody will know to say that if you don't tell them. And that's where the, those lovely four-step model comes in so handy. You can say, I'm sure you didn't mean for it to come across that way, but this is how it's landed with me, or this is what I've heard. And you can use this for all this, you know, talking about bosses and things. Uh, you know, I'm sure you want to respect my time on the weekend, or, you know, I, I need more clarity here. Do you mind going through this? Just start to communicate and to say, and if you're not sure what to say, say, you know what, I'm a little embarrassed to ask you this, or I, I feel like I used to you know, to think that I should know this already or, you know, just get it out there on the table. The open communication is really going to be brilliant because then people know what to do. They, they can say, okay, well, well, let's work with that. But without that, if you keep things secret, <laughs> they can't really work with, with you on that. And again, if you stick Great. to that neutral tone of voice, it works in almost 99% of the time. Yeah, was there another question? And then yeah, one other question right now, and it's actually on the counter side of that. So I love that your response for what they hear. This one is actually someone who doesn't really understand a lot of times what their manager is asking. So even though they try and re-communicate the request, they feel like at the end of the end of the day, they never get to the, the actual question itself. Any recommendations on how to work with a manager who isn't great with communicating? Yeah, you, you have to keep going at it until you've got the clarity that you need. So if you come back, for example, and say, so, you know, my understanding of these instructions is that I am to do this, 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 and this. So you spell out what you think you're supposed to do. Get mm -hmm. that back to your boss. And, again, I'd recommend a, you know, a meeting with this. Make sure you have at least a weekly meeting. Maybe you need to have a daily meeting if your work is really uh, intricate. And then go back to them and say, is this what you had in mind? So you're going to have to let your boss know. And I would give them a heads up and say, look, you might just want to try being incredibly bold and saying, I, I need more clarity than, than uh, you're probably used to giving. Or, you know, you may think that I like, but I'm actually the kind of person who really needs things spelled out quite clearly. And when you give me a, 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 like a bold objective or a rough guideline, what I'd like to do is break that down into pieces and come back with you and make sure that that's exactly what you were looking for. Is that all right with you? And see if you can't work out some way of working together because clearly your need for clarity is not getting met in this. You know, you're not getting any sort of clarity at all. And, it, you know, I don't know. It could just be um, sometimes that people have cultural differences where the communication doesn't work. Sometimes people just aren't very good at communicating. Maybe they're better at written communication than they are at verbal communication. So you might see if that is better for them or vice versa. Sometimes people are better speaking. Um, I was, you know, I was just in a crazy communication thing today and I said, you know what, I'm just going to go to see this guy in person. And so I marched over to his office and I was really upset about something, but I went in calmly and I said, look, I'm really upset. This isn't how I expected things to be. And just a very neutral tone of voice. And it all worked out beautifully. And they were able to explain in person much better than they were trying to text me what the problem was and why and how they were going to resolve it. So sometimes you just need to get in front of people. Thank you. And it, it looks like right now, Celine, we have about two minutes left. So I'll give, you, give that back to you. Well, I just want to point out, because we had we actually touched on today, Coach Yourself says, now, for some reason, I've got the old book here, but if we go, I think you guys have a better link. That's the old book. The new Coach Yourself says, the new edition, has um, a free month of coaching, online coaching in it. So that comes with the book. And that's the 101 tips. And we talked about the four-step model. That was one of the tips in this book. We talked briefly about the secret laws of attraction that looks like a relationship book. There's these little hearts here, and it is a relationship book, so it works for attracting a mate as well as for your professional relationships. So although it's not packaged as a professional book for relationships, it actually works just fine. It goes into great depth on emotional needs and boundaries and actually values in that book because it's very important if you're getting married to pick somebody with the right values. But as well, if you're in a corporate or business setting, you want to make sure your values are a match too. And if you don't know what your values are, how are you going to do that? And then I think last week I joked and said, if all else fails, if you really do have a horrendous boss and you try the four-step model and it doesn't work with them, 
then you might need a new career book. <laughs> but hopefully, with a few tips from these other books, you'll be well on your way to having a great relationship, or at least a very respectful one. Oh, and I actually got a question once about somebody who says, what happens if you don't respect your boss? And I said, you know what, there's no law that says that you have to respect your boss. You know, most, most of the time you may not respect your boss. That doesn't matter. You, you need to have your own standards. So I think, you know, don't worry if you don't respect your boss. It's not the end of the world. It's nice if you respect your boss and can look up to him or her, but it's not a requirement for you to be successful. It helps, but again, don't worry about that. I think that was um, career change coaching kit. Again, if all else fails, we have tools that can help you. So, but again, I would say try communicating first. We're giving you a lot to work on that can really make a massive difference in your career success. Um, and we've got Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all that stuff. If you want to get a, a, have a question for me, feel free to send me an email, info at lifecoach.com, but my direct email is Tulane. T-A-L-A-N-E at lifecoach.com. That will come to me personally directly. Okay. And I am in the UK, but I work with people by phone all over the world, and we have a company of coaches in the U.S. as well, and even a Spanish-speaking coach. So feel free to contact me if there's anything I can help you with further. And again, I'm, I'm sorry there's so much content, but we just I, thought, I hope I, I got everybody's questions in. Uh, thank you so much, Slane. This was incredible. Thank you for joining us last week and this week. And thank you, everyone on the phone today, for joining us for the presentation in general. And later today, you will receive a link to this recording, a survey link, which you'll also find in the chat feature here, and any supplemental materials and book information that Tulane talked about. Um, also, please find the PowerPoint slide on your panel on the right-hand side under handouts. So if you're interested in downloading the PowerPoint from today and or any of the other handouts we talked about last week, now is the time to do that on the handout panel on the right side. And of course, we have some great upcoming additional webinars and um, as well as we include the previous recording listings there. In order to find that information, please visit our website at www.colorado.edu forward slash alumni forward slash webinars. And on behalf of the LEED School of Business, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day and go best.